hold. Just give me a second. I want to see if it. All right. Seem to be doing better now. Okay. Hopefully you guys. Oh man, no. I don't have a strong connection to this server for some reason. All right, are you guys noticing, am, am I cutting on in and out? Um, like, does it seem like you're losing parts of the stream? It seems to be stabilizing now. I was getting the little, I don't know if you've ever used OBS. It wasn't until just now, okay. If you ever use OBS Studio before, it's got like a little indicator down at the bottom of how your connection with the server is. And green means you're golden, then it starts flashing yellow and red when you start dropping frames. And so for a while there, I was getting 10 and 20% dropped frames, which would not have been a fun stream for you guys to watch. But it looks like it's settled down. I'm pretty solid green. My total drop frames is just continuing to decrease as a percentage. So it seems like we're good. Heath, excellent to see you once again. Um, I was watching that video that you had posted the other day about you know playing in the backyard with your family and stuff, and I noticed that you were wearing jeans, and I was very very envious that you even have your jeans not like tucked into the back of a of a closet right now because it is so freaking hot in Arizona, man, it is it is miserable. Um, so a little envious of you of that, but it looked like you guys were having a lot of fun. Um, all right, so. One thing I wanted to show off a little bit, I don't have my shirt on, I, I probably should have, but I got this in the mail this week. Um, my excellent favorite new mug, which is my Gorilla with a Brush um, coffee mug, full of delicious coffee because I need it today. Um, Cafe Press, my I set up a Cafe Press store for um, doing merchandise rather than that kind of front-loaded patient paying it for myself. So Cafe Press is taking care of all of that, which is kind of cool because they have a way bigger selection of merchandise than I could ever really uh, offer. Um, I didn't put a lot of time into it yet. I know there's tons and tons of stuff that I could put on the store that aren't there right now, but there's like iPad cases and cell phone cases, uh, mugs and cups and flasks uh, shot glasses, hats, t-shirts, men's and women's t-shirts, kids t-shirts, sweatshirts, tons and tons of cool stuff. You can get my fun little gorilla logo on there. Um, um, the best part about it though is not just can you you know show your love for the stream, but any of the profits that I get from Cafe Press, so they give me a portion of, of the sales. Um, any of that money that comes in, I'm just going to turn right around and donate it to the animal charities that I support. Um, I've mentioned this before on the stream, so for those of you who tune in all the time, I apologize for repeating myself, but um, I'm a big supporter of animal-based charities. My three favorite are Gorilla Fund International um, to kind of just support the namesake that I, I use on my um, screen or my for my painting. But, you know, Gorilla Habitat is rapidly destroying, uh, being destroyed. And so um, the Gorilla Fund does huge amounts of work with local populations near where the gorillas live to try to save their habitats and try to, to live in coexistence with them. So they do a lot of good stuff. Arizona Animal Welfare League, which is Arizona's largest no-kill animal shelter, and then they also do community outreach things. And then the Arizona Pet Project, which helps to intervene when animals are coming in to shelters. Um, they either go out and they do you know spay and neutering clinics out in people's communities to help um, to help cut down on um, unwanted pets that end up just becoming strays or, or um, end up in the shelters. They also uh, intervene when people can't afford veterinary care for their animals. So if people show up at a shelter basically to just surrender their animal because they can't afford to take care of it anymore, they'll intervene with those people. So those are my three favorite animal charities that um, I donate a portion of all of the painting income, 25% of any of the painted models I sell or commissions that I take on, I donate to one of those three charities. Um, the Cafe Press stuff is all also being donated. I'm pretty sure 
on the website. I think I'm donating all of that to the Arizona Animal Welfare League. I can double check that one, but I haven't gotten any money from them yet, so um, from Cafe Press yet, but um, I'll double check that for sure. But that's all getting do donated to Arizona Animal Welfare League. The other thing, Zach, you're here, and Jesse. What's up, man? Yeah, Heath said that he was ordering stuff on there the other day, so that's awesome. Um, my stuff came pretty quickly. It came within about, um, I think it was shipped within three or four days, and then it was like slow shipping, so you know, five to seven days after that. But I, you know, within a week to ten days, I think pretty much, I got my stuff, um, and really high quality. The the printing on the t-shirts was great. The mug, the printing on the mug is fantastic. It's really crisp and clear and looks really fun. Um, just got in another set of dice bags and they're already starting to sell. I've only got five left of them. 100% um, of the money that I take in from the dice bags also goes to charity. Um, and uh, I think last time I split it 50-50 between Arizona Animal Welfare League and Pet Project. Um, so I might do that again. We'll see. But it's all going to charity regardless. $25 minimum d uh, donation for this. You can either, uh, you, that's just best thing is to do is to contact me, but $25 minimum. Anything you donate above $25, it's still 100% is going to charity. I don't keep anything that I get from these. So I paid for the dice bags out of my own pocket. And then anything you guys donate, all of that goes to charity. Um, so it's a way to, to support a really good cause. These are fantastic dice bags. You can kind of see the size of them. Let me show you how much they hold. What's up, Dread Roll? So I don't know if you can see just how many dice are in this thing, right? And that's, I don't know, about half full. Sorry for the loud uh, crashing noises, but um, there's tons and tons of dice. There's still room in here if I wanted to have tokens, um, tape measure. These are made out made by Grayed Out Productions. Um, just kind of show you how they'll come if you, if you buy one. Um, you have a nice little Grayed Out quality seal there that they come. Um, these designs in the past ones I had the nine pocket design. I decided to go for the five pocket design this time. I think it's a little bit easier to get in stuff in and out of the inside pockets, but it's nice. You can sort your dice. You can, um, you know, have a miniature in there. If you're going to RPG night, put the RPG dice in the little pockets, then your miniature is protected from those. So a lot of cool stuff. Uh, forgive me for front loading all of this with non-painting stuff, but I kind of like to just talk with you guys a few minutes just to let people catch up. Um, you know, people who are seeing the tweet that we went live or getting the email um, and just give them a few minutes to catch up to the stream before we actually get started painting. So get all that stuff out of the way. Let me double check um, how the chat room's going here. So Zach's here, good to see you, man. Those are coming order on Wednesday, cool. Um, Red Walls here, painting again. He couldn't pay for the last two months. Yeah, the, the um, again, what's cool is it's got those pockets inside. You know, if you if you play Guild Ball, let's say you have the tokens, like one of the token sets or something, you know, just throw the token sets in one of those side pockets, and then you throw all your dice in the main pocket, and it keeps your dice and your tokens sorted, and then you just take it with you. You know, if you got a tape measure or something, throw it in there also. Um, there's literally, it still was kind of hard to see even though I was showing. So, you know, the Cubix uh, boxes of dice, there were two of the kind of medium sized dice. So there are, four. I'm pretty sure those, those come in sets of 12, I believe, right? So there were two of those boxes and then there were two boxes of the little mini, um, the mini dice were 36 come in a box. So there were 72 mini dice, there were 24 medium dice, Plus I had two full sets of RPG dice in there and some extra random dice. So that was how many was in there and it was like half full. So there's plenty of room for, no matter what game you're playing, there's plenty of room for, for the dice that you need and like I said, tape measures and tokens and things like that. So if you're interested in those, again, I, only, I now only have five of those left as of recording this on uh, the 8th of July. Um, so they're going fast. Please let me know if you are interested. I just saw the red flash again. Uh, please let me know if you're interested in those bags. Um, I could always do more orders if they sell as fast as the first group, but um, uh, the first set of the first set of those bags, I, before I even got them in, they were all sold. So my red light keeps flashing.
Okay, I'm gonna try to start painting. Um, you guys in chat, just, um, there's no link on my website for it. Um, Jesse, basically just message me and uh, we can talk about it. Yeah, You've um, bought stuff from me before. It's just, you just send the money to me through PayPal um, and um, we can talk about it there. But yeah, just message me. There's no, again, there's no specific link only because I'm not necessarily consist considering carrying those 100% of the time. Um, I'm just doing those as fundraise, charity fundraisers right now. So um, the stuff that's on my website is more like models, painted models that I have for sale and then just models that I'm kind of selling on an ongoing basis or um, links to my cafe press store. But yeah, best thing to do would be to just message me. All right, let's get, oh man. I don't even have my water for painting. Whew. Sorry guys, it's always a little bit of a rush to get ready here for, for the, Saturday, the Sunday streams because um, coming from rock climbing before this and trying to eat lunch and uh, take a shower and get everything set up. So um, I apologize if I'm always a little, a little out of sorts when we get started here. So let me show you, I actually finished Hamish this week. So he is all done now. Again, so this is what we're going to be shooting for. I'll be showing you how to replicate this. And if you've been watching in the past, um, we finished William Wallace the week before. In terms of these are the sample busts, right? So this is what we're trying to achieve. So that's what we're shooting for uh, so far. Hey Zach, I'm glad you stopped by even for just a few minutes. Uh, sorry to hear your cat was in the hospital. I saw some posts about that. Um, I hope he's okay. Um, he was the cat that looks like one of my cats, which instantly just you know, broke my heart a little bit when I saw he was sick. So um, hopefully everything's okay. I'm glad he can come home. We'll talk to you later. So this is where we're at right now. The um, We've got the flesh tones pretty much down. Get him a little bit out of the direct light so he doesn't look quite as weird. Um, we have to do a little bit of extra highlighting on some of the flesh areas. When everything's done, I think I'm gonna bring out a few of the extreme highlight points still. Um, he's got a very piercing, steely-eyed glare at the moment. Um, his eyes are pretty light, so we'll see as things develop if that kind of becomes a, a bit of a a distraction we can touch that up a little bit the other thing I'll say is he looks a little weird both of them do because right now the flesh is carrying up into the hair which is giving kind of a weird like halo around his face but that'll go away once we start uh, base coating the hair but last session we got to this point on the tartans so we got the three colors down we have the uh, the texture on them and again this is what we're going for ultimately I'll show you Hamish's. You can see that we're not quite there yet. We've got the basic pattern down, we've got the texture down, but the color isn't quite right. So today, that what we're gonna at least start off doing is getting this to look like this. So one of the things you've seen me do a lot with cloth and with tattoos um, it's, it's common for both of these things, um, like especially when you have patterns in the cloth that you're doing, is that you want that, that pattern to sink into the surface of what we're painting. So people's tattoos, you know, if you paint them on top of the skin, it often will look like war paint or, you know, somebody just drawing on their arm as opposed to actually being physically part of the, the skin. Uh, same thing with designs and fabric. You want it to look like it's inside the fabric, not on top of the fabric like it was painted on top. So part of, the, or the main technique we do for that is we do, we glaze over the detail and try to sink it below several thin layers of paint that kind of pushes it down visually into the surface of what we're, we're painting. 
And so that's what we're going to do with this. Um, I will admit that my notes when I was writing about which color I used for this, I put um, uh, far brown question mark birch question mark because I forgot to write that step and I was trying to remember which color I grabbed when I was uh, um, when I was actually doing it. I'm going to use birch. I don't think it's going to matter because this first part we're not going to go super crazy with it. But if at the end the ultimate effect looks a little lighter than the sample models it will be because I used the wrong color here probably. Again, probably shouldn't matter, but this is just going to be an off-white color. So whatever off-white uh, brand that you, or paint that you have, whatever brand you like, kind of show, show it under camera maybe a little bit better. You can see the label is white, which gives you a good reference right next to there for what this color looks like. Off-white, kind of a, a bone color. And as I like to say at this stage in the painting, this is where we take all of the beautiful detail and all the hard work that we've done, and we just paint over all of it. <laughs> it never ceases to amaze me that this actually works, but... We want this really thin because I really don't want the tartan to look like bone at the end. Okay, just kind of give you an idea. As I wipe it on my palette, it really beads up. It's very watery. I put it on my paper towel. Might be kind of hard to see, but it, it just instantly soaks in and spreads out, which is a good sign for your glazes. That's the consistency we're looking for. Um, I haven't talked too much about brushes recently, so let me just take a moment because I know Jesse, who's watching this was asking me about brushes the other day and for these larger sizes so sizes one and two especially I prefer the Raphael 8404 series brush to the Winsor & Newton I like the Winsor & Newton for the super fine detail brushes but the Raphael I prefer the larger sizes but one thing I will say is usually people when they first start buying really high quality brushes um, there are some people who think that they must have got defective product because they're not used to the way that true natural versatile say, um, Kalinske sable brushes behave. And so they'll use a brush like this. This is actually fairly new. You can see, like, you know, I haven't used it a ton. There's not a lot of wear and stuff on the brush. There's not a lot of built up paint anywhere. Um, but they'll use this brush once or twice and then they'll get it and they'll go, wait, this, my brush is failing. Look at this tip. Isn't it supposed to be sharp? Like, what's wrong with my brush? I wasted money, whatever. Um, these Kalinsky Sable brushes just do this. The natural hair does this. Um, so one of the things you have to do is you kind of have to get your brush ready to go. So if it's dry, you get some paint on it, and you twist and pull. And then I tap a little bit on my paper towel. Just kind of repeat this process. You don't have to do the dropping part. Repeat this process a couple times. Pull and twist, and what you'll see is that your brush ends up in a super duper fine point. You can paint with this perfectly fine. Now you can even, this is a size one brush, but I could do intricate detail work with this brush. If I rinse it out, it actually holds its point pretty well. You just kind of have to, to get it a little bit ready to work with the first time you, you start on a painting session. But then once you do, it's going to be a fantastic brush. It's just once it dries, it gets all like kind of splayed looking a little bit. But but don't worry. Like you just just do this technique to get it going. Hey Janice, what's up? It's really good to see you on stream, man. 
All right, so back to the painting. So what I'm going to do is, like I, like I said, I'm just going to end up painting over this entire thing. Um, get a little paint on my brush, tap it on my paper towel, and I'm just going to paint over the entire cloth. I want to be careful. I don't really want the paint to pool anywhere because I don't want it to dry and have really thick of these off-white spots. So if you start to notice it pooling, especially down in the cracks, you know, just, just grab some of that with a slightly drier brush. I'll end up usually just tapping my brush on the paper towel again and then touching those areas and it soaks right into the brush. So. So again, the purpose of this technique is just, just to really start getting some layers of paint on top of the texture below it and the colors below it. And this does a few different things. First of all, it helps to unify all the different um, colors that we have here. Um, as they stand, they're pretty stark against each other. The orange and the green really stand out against each other the darker and the lighter green. So doing this helps to unify those layers. And it does so in a way that helps to mimic the wear of actual cloth. And in a minute here, I'll pull back up our reference picture. But before I do that, while I'm just kind of finishing uh, William Wallace's first coat here, Think about like your favorite old t-shirt, you know, that maybe has a printed design on it. But over time, you know, the printed design starts to fade a little bit. Um, whatever the bright color that you might have had in that t-shirt starts to fade a little bit. Everything gets a little bit more muted, you know, less saturated. And there kind of has this similar, like slightly lighter, um, like, uh, like kind of tinge to everything on the, on the cloth, you know, parts where, wherever the raised areas on the cloth were, you know, with each stitching, everything just kind of gets worn a little bit more than the, the fabric below it. And so you just kind of get a nice uniform worn look to, to fabric. And so, like if we look at, you know, we look at this reference picture, for instance, like you kind of, over the entire surface of the cloth, there's this little bit of white or off-white, like fuzz that just kind of covers everything. Um, and so really what we're trying to do is just kind of unite all the fabric so that, again, everything looks like it's dyed into the fabric, but then, you know, it's it's realistic. So nothing is on top of the fabric. Um, or the, the, the dye is not on top of the fabric, it's inside of the fabric. Hey, thanks, man. Uh, in case you're interested, these are available on my website, actually. I, do, I sell these busts. Um, so if you go to grillwithabrush.com um, and there's a tab that says Celtic Busts, you can click on that so you can order these from my website. So if you are at all interested in painting these, Just check it out there. So I use all. Uh, I often use, well, for this one, I'm using off-white to start with. I'm actually gonna switch to brown in a little bit here. 
but I want to switch to the off-white because the most raised areas of the the tartan I want to have a little bit of that look like I just showed you on the, the reference picture but also when I add the brown in the brown is going to make this darker really fast it's gonna really start to mute everything that's underneath it and so I want to have a few layers of something that's not darkening the colors right now just so I can get more layers on top of the the fabric to really sink it in more and make it feel a little bit more warm especially at this scale you know, I want that detail to be you know, a little more noticeable than on a smaller scale model um, when I do like when I did all the the fabric for the last batch of, of dwarves that I painted and each one of them had very detailed fabric for the most part those the glazing on those fabrics were all glazed back over in the base coat of that fabric so if it was purple fabric and i went in and drew designs on it um, the the initial glaze of what i'm doing right now was done back with the darker purple base coat or if it was like a red then I probably had a darker red as my base coat, worked up to some lighter red, add some designs. The glazing was back with the foundation color red. And then, you know, adding in some shadows and things like that later, which will help to, to make the details, like if you're doing fabric designs or something, helps those sink into being less visible as you go into the folds. Um, just like with real fabric, if you're not getting a lot of reflection light on a certain area of the fabric, you tend not to see the texture and the detail on it very much because um, that stuff comes out in the reflection of light off of the material that you can actually see. So things that go down into the shadows, you just don't see the detail as, as vividly and it'll start to disappear down into the folds. And so doing the, the shadows like we'll eventually do here helps to make that happen, makes it look really realistic. All right, I think I'm gonna do one more pass with this. Thanks, Heath. Johnny on the spot with the, the link to the busts. too fast for my own good there it's not quite dry yet gotta let him dry um, I'll take this moment to show you the difference between the two the two guys I did um, so if you look at Wallace's um, tartan his actually looks a little lighter at the bright spots just just a little bit than uh, than Hamish's um, I didn't really notice that I was doing this at the time but I think what probably happened was as I was doing the next uh, set of steps we'll do with when we started to do the brown that I started to do f I did fewer layers on the raised areas here of the brown than I did with Hamish's I think I probably coated like all of his a little bit more with the brown and I stayed away from the highlighted areas a little bit more on his which is why you kind of get some brighter spots on on his it's a little hard it's a little more stark in in person um, but you might be able to see that doesn't help that he's more in, in the spotlight. So you can see everything's a little bit more muted. He's got a little bit more highlighting on the, the raised areas. You can control this with how many um, layers of the, the brown glaze you do.
been a busy, busy, busy summer for me work-wise, I tell you. I have not gotten nearly as much time to paint as I was hoping. A couple weeks late starting my, my next project. Things have backed up a little bit. but I've got three, well, two of the big five deadlines I had to get done this summer are done as of this morning. Well, at least for my part. Um, a third one is going to get finished with some long days of work, uh, hopefully by the end of this week. So then three of the five will be done. I can get those last two big projects, deadlines done. It'll be, it'll be a very, very, very productive summer, but I'm looking forward to the fall. Hopefully get more, more painting time this fall. So, move that colossal dice bag. You know, just another little product placement. Again, cafepress.com slash gorilla with a brush. Get your gear. <clears throat> All right, we're going to go to Dubai Brown next. Uh, Dubai Brown is actually my favorite brown from Scale Color. I really, really like it. I also think it's fantastic with just the slightest touch of black added to it. it has a nice, uh, just a nice brown for a lot of different purposes. So again, mix up a glaze with this. So, over top of what we just did, now I'm going to glaze the brown. Again, I don't really want it to pool, although I will say I'm not as concerned with this one as long as the pooling happens down in the recesses and not up on top of the fabric. You know, if you start to notice some of it runs down into the to the folds, it's not nearly as bad because this brown is ultimately kind of the first part of getting those shadows to be darker. And so having some of that accumulate down in the crevices is not the worst thing in the world. The biggest downside of having it happen is um, mostly that it, it increases the drying time between your, your stages. So if you're doing multiple layers like we're doing on this guy, but you're only doing one bust at a time instead of say two, or you're only doing one model at a time, it just increases the amount of time between each layer of, of glaze. But a lot of times what I'll do is, if I'm just working on one model and it requires a lot of glazing like this, um, I will try to have two parts on the model that I'm working on at the same time and jump back and forth between them while each one is drying. So maybe on a model like this, um, you know, I could be working on his hair and also working on the, the tartan or, um, you know, something like that. Just pick two areas that aren't going to interfere with each other too much and try to work on those. Or have two different models that you're working on. That works too.
took yesterday totally off of, of working. Try to get out of my house and get away from stuff just because I've been doing like seven days a week work lately. And so um, spent about eight hours at my brother-in-law's house yesterday. We were just watching movies, eating bad food, and uh, assembling his new Lego kit. He got the, the uh, Star Wars Lego Y-Wing collector series model, which is you know thousands of pieces of really intricate detail. It's like a two foot long replica of the, the Y-Wing ship. Just amazing build. It's so interesting to see how these Lego engineers like put all of that together and how they use pieces that I remember from a, from being a kid of things that were on different sets and like just the creativity and how they use them to to reproduce these ships is just mind blowing. So that was fun, but it you know, it took two of us working together. Like I said about eight hours with you know, like an hour break for lunch, so about seven hours the two of us together to put it together. So it was quite an ordeal, um, but a lot a lot of fun. And then last night I went over to my brother's house. He just moved into a new house, um, which I'm really excited about because he used to live almost an hour away from me, and now he's only about 15 minutes away. Um, but he's in his new house now and wanted to have a couple people over to play games. So I went over there with a couple other people, and we played some board games. So that was fun last night. I can't remember the name of it, actually. Dinosaur Park or something. It's basically Jurassic Park, but just not named that. And uh, each of you is responsible for building your own dinosaur island with attractions and um, monitoring or collecting, you know, researching DNA, um, building out your park, expanding the um, expanding the pins, creating dinosaurs. You know, selling them hats and t-shirts or the guests hats and t-shirts and food and all sorts of stuff and then at the end of every round all the guests show up and you get you know money and and points based on who shows up and then you have to check the threat level of everything that you've built in your park all the dinosaurs plus the variable um, threat level that occurs every round and compare it to the security you've built in your park and see if the dinosaurs escape and eat guests um, I actually quite enjoyed the game. It was pretty fun. We just played the short version of the game because we had to learn it first and then, then we tried to play it. But I won by one point. So that was, it was a close, close fought game. I just kind of thought it was funny in, in retrospect of the kind of calculations you make while you're playing games like that. You're like, okay, well, it's going to cost me this much to upgrade my security by by a point, which will prevent the dinosaurs from escaping and eating one of my guests. But I'd rather spend that money on this. Uh, I think I'm willing to sacrifice the point loss from losing one guest. And so you're like a park manager who's just, yeah, the guests are somewhat expendable. I'll, uh, I'll sacrifice one guest for, a, for more long-term benefit for my park. I didn't really think about it till I was driving home, which is how morbid that was as a, as a design element of the game. But it was a lot of fun. I just want to show you kind of where we're at here. Um, so we're getting there. Um, obviously, I don't have the 
you know, where we started today to show you, but you can already see that the color is getting more muted. Um, we're getting a little bit more unified look. We're just about there. I might do one or two more layers with the brown over everything before I start to do the shadows. And once we start darkening the shadows, everything will really come alive on these. It's good if you're using these dry wells, it's good to stir your paint pretty often. Especially the scale 75 colors, they separate pretty quickly. Small Adventures, what's up, man? I always do that. I feel bad. I, I don't know. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. I didn't mean to be uh, gender specific there. I have no idea. Quoting some Elton John on a Sunday. I like it. Well, I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate everybody who's here today. Um, always a good day when you can stream with, with friends. Paint some fun busts. kind of checking things. I think we're good with the initial coloring. Yeah, I'm happy with where we're at now. So I am going to take a little bit of the flat black Um, I just happened to grab because I'm partway through the bottle on this. This is the Warfront black. Uh, as far as I can tell, it is identical to the flat black that comes in the scale 75, the scale colors line. Um, I haven't noticed any difference between the two of them. And as I said before, I really, really like using the scale, uh, the scale color black for glazing. That might have gone too far. That's pretty dark. So we'll use that for our, um, our final glaze. We'll mix up a little bit next to it that's not quite so dramatic. But I like it because, because it's so flat, um, it glazes into shadows really, really nicely and just disappears. It provides darkness without any reflection that you'll get with, with blacks that um, are more reflective. And so the shadows really just disappear when you glaze the flat black down into them. So. I really like it. 
It's not the best color if you're trying to do large areas of black, like if you're doing a base and you're doing, or a plinth or something, you're just doing black all around and you just want it to be black. Um, it's not a very dark, dark black. It's a little bit of a gray black. It just doesn't dry, it doesn't end up very dark. So it's not great for that purposes. I tend to prefer the GW or the P3 paints blacks when I need uh, large areas of just black color. They're also more durable than the scale 75 colors for bases and things like that. Putting together some final touches on the first dragon, watching the King of Tartans do his job. Oh, I appreciate that. All right, so this is not quite as dark as the uh, accidental um, super dark brown I had. Yeah, young red dragon going more natural maroon palette. Cool, man. Yeah, I did. Don't mean it that way. Is uh, what's the scale of the dragon that you're um, that you're working on? We got a visitor. Um, you'll notice what I'm doing here with the uh, with this layer is I'm actually now working more down into the shadows. So I'm going to leave the most the highest raised areas of the cloth. I'm just going to leave those the, the color we're at now. I'm going to push this paint down into the recesses. Not, not just the deepest parts we will get down to working to there. Um, just to essentially avoid the, the highest highlight areas and kind of start pushing this paint down into the, the cracks. Be a little aware of your brush stroke. Uh, as I've talked about before, your brush stroke pulls the paint with it. So you tend to want to kind of start, like in this area, the recesses are this way, I kind of start and work pulling my brush towards the, the crack as much as possible. Sometimes with the angle, it's not really possible to do that, but just as, as much as possible, push your brush in the direction of the shadow areas. Again, you can't see it, it's off screen, but I tap my I tap my brush on the paper towel every time before I first start taking brush to model. Gets that excess paint off the brush so that I can really have more control over it. And it's really more of a glaze than a wash where the wash just kind of goes everywhere and does lots of pooling. I want to have more control over it.
while that dries, just kind of take a moment to, if you if you could think back about what this looked like at the beginning of the stream, you know, what the different colors and the variation in the colors and everything looked like. Um, hopefully you can really start to see a difference about how everything's a little more muted now, a little bit more unified in the look of the, uh, the cloth. We're getting a little bit more of that effect of it really being um, dyed into the, co the fabric and then the fabric over time wearing evenly across the entire surface. So we're getting a little bit of a nice natural looking fiber or a natural looking, I keep saying cloth. Um, I mean, really, I'm guessing that's probably wool. It's made out of wool specifically, which is giving it the large fiber look to it as well as um, you know the unique wear pattern that different fabrics will have. Now it's quite possible that you could achieve the same effect that I'm doing with fewer passes of slightly thicker paint. However, I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of time for greater control. So by keeping the paint extremely thin and doing building this up in, in layers, I have total control over how dark each area gets by simply on the upper, every pass just deciding do I want to paint another layer on this particular area of the color that I'm using. And so I have really fine control over how dark certain spots get, where the darkest shadows are, how much I can see through into the layers and the textures below. So the again, so I'm I'm happy to sacrifice a little bit of my a little bit of my time for, for greater control over the paint. But feel free to experiment, um, especially if you're one of those people who likes to grab test models and try things out on different models. You know feel free to experiment with how much you can get away with essentially. Um, if you paint this design, something like a cloth or tartan design, how thick can you make the paint and still have it pull off the look you want? Because um, if you can obviously build up some shortcuts and save yourself some time, it's never a bad thing as long as it's getting the effect that you want. Let's catch up here, let's see. Dragon looks like at small adventure 28. I'm gonna check well because I gotta wait a second for that to dry anyway. Let me pull that up.
Is that Instagram? I was searching Twitter. It might be Instagram. Here we go. Let's see. Don't see a dragon on there. Showed my wife the gallery. Dropped off for a minute. Her reaction. Censored. What gallery? Have I have not been really following the World Cup except to know that a bunch of people in England were super happy about how their team was doing. Um, I don't know if they're still happy, but... I get a feeling that they're sort of long-suffering fans who have been often disappointed. And uh, so I just darken this just a hair using the, the darker um, brown that I had. I throw one more brushful in there. So work up into the shadow area below where his hair is. Work down towards the, the leather strap. The next face a team that should be an easy one. So then they're going to be in the World Cup finals then? If, assuming they win that game? Or are we not quite there yet? Are there still a few rounds before that? So I thought I thought I heard or saw a commercial that they were doing semifinals now, right? Or is the semifinals like a whole pool play or something? So who should I be rooting for, Heath? Who's who's the who's the better story of the teams that are left? You know, like if they had to have a feel good story, is it is it England? Like are the the fans with no particular rooting interest in terms of, you know, they're from a certain country, are they It's like is it the fans hope that England wins? Or is there some other team
All right, I will. I will cheer for England to win. I might watch the finals when it comes up. I tend to, you know, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. Um, the main sports that I was in, that I spent a lot of time in, I, I played football. I did that like fourth grade through eighth grade, and I had a really, really bad separated shoulder in eighth grade. And so I just decided, you know, hey, I'm not really planning on becoming a professional football player and not planning to go to college for football on a football scholarship or anything. So I'm really not gonna sacrifice the long-term health of my shoulder for continuing this nonsense. So um, I stopped playing in eighth grade, but then I, I coached all through high school. I coached like little kids um, football teams. Um, so I have a long history with football. I, I kind of enjoy watching football, but I tell you probably after I was about 25 years old, I had a really hard time watching football games where I didn't have a, a rooting interest. So I can't just turn on like a random, you know, Falcons versus Chargers or something. Like I, I just can't watch those games. I have to have a rooting interest. So, you know, I'll occasionally watch some Arizona State Sun Devil football games. So that's my alma mater and that's where I work. Occasionally watch some Arizona Cardinals games, local team, but, you know, not religiously. Same thing with baseball, kind of comes and goes, how much of the local baseball team I'll watch. I'll watch the World Series, though, um, no matter who's in it, just for sort of cultural awareness, you know, what, what what's going on in the world of, of sports. And, um, you know, I watch the, I'm, probably my favorite sport right now is hockey, but again, I really just only watch the the local team play. My buddy is a major hockey fan, watches everything. He's constantly talking about this player or that player, and, I, and I'm always like, who? I, he's like, what are you talking about? That guy's been an all-star for five years in a row. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't know who he is. If he doesn't play for the Arizona Coyotes, um, and his name isn't like Sidney Crosby or something, I probably don't know who he is. So, but that's all of that being said, I I do like to watch the the finals for a lot of these things. Just again, kind of for cultural re uh, reference and just understanding what's going on and what what everybody's all hyped about. Basketball is the same way. I, I usually watch the finals, but pretty much nothing else before that. Um, air conditioned air conditioned buildings is where we play hockey. Um, well, I'm waiting for that to dry a little bit. I'm going to show you guys this too. So I started I drilled the holes out um, for the pegs. The uh, busts are going to go on these plinths. Um, right now they're just they're resin plinths from Dragonforge. Um, I really really like his resin plinths. Um, they're incredibly high quality, like just um, basically require no sanding. He has no mold lines on him because he doesn't do any um, like undercutting that require it. So it's just like a filled mold. So he just fills it like this. So occasionally you'll see air bubbles on the bottom, but I've yet to see any blemish or anything on the actual uh, plinth itself. So I've, I'm really impressed. The biggest problem with Dragon Forge is they just tend to be uh, really slow to send you your stuff because he's so backed up. It's pretty much just him, um, you know, pouring molds and or creating molds and pouring casts and stuff as fast as he can. So it can take like two months or so to get your order, um, but they're super high quality. So I really like these. But I'm putting the busts. They're about the size of the wooden pillars are on now, so that it's going to kind of look pretty similar, except they won't be on the the 
paperclip pegs they'll actually be on um, more thick metal things that go up to the middle if you watch that first video the session zero um, I drilled the holes up into the busts um, already pre-signed these um, and again these painted versions um, are available for sale uh, I won't sh wouldn't ship them to you until after the the paint alongs over but either the sample set I did or the sample that we're painting along with here uh, those are number one and number two of the limited edition castings so if you're at all interested either just because you love the models love the paint job or you're actually painting these or planning to paint these at home yourself and you would really like the visual reference in person of what they actually look like in person um, just let me know send me a message we can arrange something but yeah my brother actually plays hockey plays in adult league hockey out here in Arizona One really interesting phenomenon we have here in the valley, you don't probably even know what that means, but they, they call this area the Valley of the Sun, sort of the Phoenix metropolitan region. Um, we sit in a depression that's between a whole bunch of mountains that surround us. I'm not actually sure it's technically a valley. Some people say it's geologically, it's technically what's called a basin uh, as opposed to a valley but regardless they call it the valley of the sun uh, we're sort of ringed by mountains all around the outside of the phoenix metro area and um you know the this area didn't really start growing a large population until the 1950s and 60s when uh, air conditioning became something that was affordable for you know normal people living in their houses uh, it was really the only way to make it uh, truly livable here so you know, we didn't start seeing population explosion until the 50s and 60s, and then you know, population has continued to increase. We're now the fifth largest metro region in the country. Um, but because of that, you know, most of the people who live here are all people who've moved here from other places, especially from the Midwest, you know, places like Indiana, Ohio, Illinois. My cat's rubbing against the screen. That's why it's shaking. Um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, all sorts of places like that. We have tons of people here from all of those states. And so we kind of get a, we have a weird fan base here where most people's allegiances are not to the home teams first. So maybe if you're a hockey fan you um, and you come from Illinois, you're a Blackhawks fan. You also like the Coyotes, but you're a Blackhawks fan first and foremost. And if they're not playing the Blackhawks, you can cheer for the Coyotes, but you're first and foremost that, or, you know, whatever, insert whatever team. And that's true for pretty much all the different sports. So, you know, people, when you have home games here in the Valley, a lot of times significant chunks of the people who are, are there at the game are there to see the other team that's playing. So, you know, the home field advantage in Arizona is often not as, as extreme as it is other places because a big chunk of the fans... Um, are either you know snowbirding here so they're spending the winter in Arizona and they're they just you know root for the other team because they're there to see them or um, they live here in the valley but they're primarily there to see the visiting team and so that's kind of why you get a little bit more bandwagon behavior um, for some of the sport teams here in the valley because everybody sort of sees them as their second favorite team in whatever whatever sport and so when they're not doing that well they just pay more attention to their home team, original home team. I think it's slowly changing over time as you know we start having generations that were born here and grew up here. But that's always been a characteristic of the Valley sports scene. Lots of people whose second allegiances are to the Arizona teams as opposed to first allegiances.
Yeah, we were yeah we were fifth largest. We were sixth largest for a while. We were kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Philadelphia that we've been back bouncing back and forth between who is fifth and who is sixth. Um, but yeah, the Phoenix metro region um, square square mileage wise is huge. Population wise, you know, it's like six million people or something. I think. Roughly thereabouts. One of the things too is that we are extremely spread out. Um, the population density is very low. Square mileage is very, very large. Because what essentially we were, were a whole bunch of different cities that all just grew into each other as opposed to sort of growing out from the hub of, of downtown Phoenix area. There were a bunch of outlying communities that just kept getting bigger and bigger and growing into this essentially one, eventually one mass city. You drive from one corner of the county to the other and you know, you pass through 10 cities, but you wouldn't ever, you would never realize it if there wasn't a sign on the side of the road because it's just continuous development. I'd be interested to, to compare uh, Maricopa County, which is where I live. Um, that's where Phoenix is located in Maricopa County. Most of the, the suburbs of Phoenix are all in that county. Square mileage wise, it's a huge county. I wouldn't be surprised if square mileage wise, it's larger than like Rhode Island and Connecticut, like those kind of small states. I wouldn't be surprised if Maricopa County is like the size of those. And it's pretty much 100% full of development at this point. We're going to switch over to this darker brown now. I'll probably end up doing one final glaze at the very, very, very end with just straight black in a couple places, but I might not have to. This is actually pretty dark when I put it on the paper towel. It's pretty close to black. So. Again, if you can kind of imagine or recall what this looked like before we started today. We've come a long way so far. I'm going to start to be much more careful with where I'm putting this paint because I really, really want this to start just accenting the deepest shadows. Whereas before I was fine being a little sloppy because it's so thin, you know, it's not, it's not going to make that big of a difference if you get a little bit where you didn't want. But as we start going into these darker and darker colors, I want to isolate that, that color more and more.
I agree. Said uh, painting leather is a cool technique, but man, is it tricky. Definitely agree. Pretty sure you were showing me some pictures a, a couple weeks ago, right? Of some of the stuff you were doing. That leather on it was fantastic that you were painting. So whatever you're doing, keep it up. One of the other reasons you want to avoid pooling if you can is when the paint is this thin, when it pools and it starts to dry, you can end up with paint rings. So it tends to sort of create like, like a dark ring where it's lighter on the outside, lighter on the inside, and you just get like a dark ring. And then it's kind of hard to undo that with future paths, paths, passes of the glaze because it's not a very thick color. And so that can really kind of mess you up. Um, I have just a touch of that happening here, right where this like little pocket is on uh, the tartan right there. I might end up having to go in with a little bit thicker dark paint to just paint the deepest part of that where we get the little tide or little thing going. Yeah, it's definitely, these type of techniques, you know, they take time. Things like what I'm doing with the tartan um, take a lot of time, but the effect just to me is worth the time, um, especially if you're going for display pieces like this where, um, you know, you're not trying to paint an entire army like this. Now, I, being an insane person, would actually paint an entire army like this, and I kind of did with my, <laughs> my troll bloods that I had for Privateer Press where I painted them for five straight years and still only had like I don't know, a third of the models that I owned painted. Finally got to two fully painted tournament armies about the time I quit the game. <laughs> but that's because I'm an insane person. But yeah, so you finally, you finally caved and got some scale color paints and they're quite different from P3. I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, for a long time I painted with Citadel paints and Privateer Press paints were my primary ones. A little bit, of, little bit of Vallejo here and there, but for the most part it was those. And I will tell you, when I got scale color paints, I talk about them a lot of time because a, a lot of because I really like them. But one of the reasons I really like them, and will always like them, even if one day I end up moving on to other things, is because they're such a different type of paint. They really work differently. They forced me to do a whole bunch of new things. They forced me to learn and, and learn how to, to paint in ways that those particular paints um, take advantage of. And so it really pushed me as a painter, pushed my, changed my enjoyment level. I was feeling a little stagnated with my, where I was at in my painting journey. Felt like I hadn't gotten better in a while, which was partly because I spent a lot of my time working on that that one army where I was trying to match 
what I had been painting over the last five years. So I, I just felt like I wasn't progressing as a painter. Um, so they came along right at the end of that and just really pushed me to learn new things, to develop. And so that's one of the things I actually really love most about them. And why I recommend people try a lot of different paint brands. Um, partly just to, to push yourself, because when you try to do things you've always done, and you do try to do it with a new paint line, you might find it doesn't quite work the same way, and you're forced to learn a little bit of a new technique. I exhausted the space on my paper towel with all my dabbing. I'm actually very, very intrigued by war colors. Um, tempted to order some of those and try them. A lot of people, some people don't like them. I've seen a lot of people who say they do like them. They would never go back to anything else. But they're supposed to use a gel medium, which just is intriguing to me. And I believe that they are designed to do a lot of what P, of what the um, scale color are designed to do, which is to do a lot of glazing. And so I'd be really interested to see how they actually perform um, in these roles compared to what the scale colors do. I just kind of take stock of where we're at here. think actually pretty darn happy with where we're at. So what do you guys think? Again, try to um, remember what, what we started with today. Got a nice uh, look, a little more worn look to the fabric. We've got um, all the colors are a little more tied together, but you can still see that texture that we built up in those um, in our session before. Kind of compare it to. this pretty close pretty close to spot on I actually think we've managed to mute it just a tiny bit more on the second bust compared to the first bust which is not a bad thing So again, this one ended up being a little brighter. I put more uh, coats of the dark over. So he's definitely, this guy definitely went more muted. Just don't, I don't love that one little crevice. Looks like I put the tie ring on there.
just have to take just a touch of the black paint. Put a little dab in there. So I'm getting near the end of my time, so it makes me a little hesitant to start the next thing. Um, what I will do though, is just to get us ready to rock and roll next time. Let's base coat the uh, kind of leather armor that they're wearing and then also the shirts that they're wearing. So that way we can just start that part next time. We can jump straight into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take US Dark Brown. It's a warfront color. It's kind of similar to the um, like Dubai Brown. If you ended up using Dubai Brown, that's fine. The Dubai Brown has just a little bit more red in it. So using this, but they're close enough that if you, if you were just to use whatever color you used for the Dubai Brown, it'd be fine. And I'm gonna add just a little bit of black to it. So we'll just base coat the, essentially what we're going to be doing is where the, the shirt is and the leather armor. We're just going to base coat those areas and then we'll be done for today. I always love when I get done with a certain region and get to base coat something that's next to it. Because as I do this, it starts to cover up all of the, the paint that got on those areas from when I was doing the other section. And because of that, it starts to clean up the, the lines of the painted areas, makes everything look nice. You start to really see the model come alive as you start to clean that up so it's always a fun part of the process <laughs> I 
I'm gonna have to pull my detail brush out to get right up next to the skin. So I'm gonna do as much as I can with this brush and then go back and clean up those.
All right, that's that. So we'll be ready to, to paint the either leather armor or the shirt or both um, when we uh, meet up next time, next Sunday. Um, thank you again for everybody who showed up today. Uh, if you have any last minute questions, you can ask me on there. I'll just talk for a minute here and we can catch up. Um, I was going to say something. Um, I don't know. But uh, Mr. Heath, Small Adventure, Jesse, uh, I know Zach was here, Giannis, um, anybody else who was lurking and didn't, didn't uh, say hi on the chat. Um, I appreciate all of you guys being here. I um, look forward to this every week, so I'm glad that you're joining me on this painting journey. Um, again, like I said, you, like I've always said, if you want to paint along with me, you don't have the busts yet, you can go to GorillaWithTheBrush.com, click on the link that says Celtic Bust, you can order a pair for yourself. Um, otherwise, if you just want to pick up tips, I'm glad that you're watching. Um, I appreciate, uh, appreciate hope you have a, uh, hope you have a wonderful week. Waiting for the last minute there. Um, do my do a couple other commercials again. Cafepress.com slash gorilla with a brush. If you want any cool gorilla with a brush gear, there's t-shirts, um, there's hats, stickers, cell phone cases, tons and tons and tons of stuff there. 100% of the profits I get from that go to charity. Um, I still have a few dice bags. So I was showing these off earlier. So just got in another shipment of these, but they're going fast. I only have, as of recording this, I only have five more. Um, they can just fit tons and tons and tons of dice, including rooms for tokens and um, um, like a ruler, or a tape measures, and everything you can need to take to your game night. Um, these are great. 100% of the, the purchase price goes to charity with these. So um, if you're interested, please let me know. Send me a message on Facebook or Twitter, um, Gorilla, at Gorilla Painter on Facebook, at Gorilla Brush on Twitter. Um, you can also go to my website. There's a contact form there, or you can email me, alan, A-L-A-N, at gorillawithabrush.com. Um, cool, yeah. Uh, Mr. Heath has put up the link for the Cafe Press store there, so if you're in chat, you can click on that too. Um, once again, thanks everybody for, sh for showing up today. Uh, until next week, take care, guys.